Hi everyone and welcome to the Noetic Podcast. I'm your host Jordan Klein and I'm joined by CJ. Hey guys. And today we're going to cover uh, chapter five, uh, book one of Montaigne's essays titled Whether the Governor of a Place Besieged Should Go Out to Parlay. And with that, I'm just going to hand over the reins over onto CJ. And as soon as you mention that title, I think a lot of us just checked out for a second because we said, I am, I am not a governor of an estate, and I hope if I am that my estate will not be besieged, and more often than not, I do not think I'm going to have to negotiate my way out of such a besieging moment in time. So it seems as if we're distant from that sentence or that title from the essay Mm -hmm. and ourselves now. But I want to emphasize that there is something to such a particular example that Montaigne is giving that in this particular lies a universal or lies something about human nature that perhaps we are overlooking in such a specific example of parlaying in a time of battle or something like that. So with that, let's just dive into the river yeah, and, and see where Montaigne goes and where it leads and what inquiries we can make from there. So like any Montaigne essay, it's going to start with some story. Got to start with a story. And he starts with the tale of Lucius Marcus, who was a Roman soldier or a Roman general in the war against Macedonia. And I believe he is fighting Perseus, who is the king of Macedon. And in this moment, they are battling and there's a negotiation and we have a truce. And this truce is going to go for several days. So Marcus is able to get some time and Perseus is able to get some time. So what Marcus does is he assembles his army and he gets enough momentum in this time of of peace to then go and annihilate Perseus and his men. So we have a victory. Yay! This is all great and dandy. But the Roman Senate is a tad upset because of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say for the most part, um, sort of using uh, tact or sort of guile, I think guile, I think is the, the right word to put it, mm-hmm. in uh, battlefield tactics was especially uh, frowned down upon for the Romans for the most part. Mm. Uh, I'd like to, we mentioned this off camera, but I'd like to <laughs> cite it uh, tonight is with uh, Odysseus. And the Greeks absolutely uh, adored Odysseus for oh, his trickery yeah exactly for his trickery and uh the romans actually did not have as a uh, praiseworthy relationship with odysseus because of that guile they prefer preferred a display of force or making a fair contest yes and that's a great that's a great example so what montaigne is highlighting in this example is that we have a certain way of looking at combat or at least in this example right Mm -hmm. is that Honor is the most important part for the Roman culture, that if you are to engage in the enemy, then you are to engage in it without, as I'll say, Montaigne quotes, not by cunning, by surprises or night encounters, by feigned flights and unexpected rallies, but rather, said by combat by valor, right? So... He, uh, he establishes that cunning and trickery go against this arc of combat or presupposing combat as something where people are engaged man to man in a quote unquote fair fight, I suppose. And he gives off a lot of 
interesting examples. I mean, one, one in particular that I enjoyed was the Florentines, who he, he says, were so far from seeking to gain advantage over their enemies by surprise that they would warn them a whole month before placing their army in the field by the continual ringing of the bell they called Martinella. So the sense that we're almost back in middle school, you know, when, when two kids are about to get in a fight and they say, you want to take this outside? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And, they, and one of them says, you know, meet me by the dumpster, you know, 2 p.m. after <laughs> science class. Don't bring anything, just you and your fist, right? That the, There's an established <laughs> yeah. rules of conduct and that both parties are going to follow that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's an expected sort of code of behavior and expectations that are set. But it isn't like that, right? And just like the example yeah, you give yeah. of, of Odysseus, mm -hmm. it's not like that all the time. Mm -hmm. And this is where we, we get our little asterisks, right? And Montaigne finds that this asterisk, this trickery that maybe we saw in Odysseus, the Greeks, and even I think he referenced the Carthaginians, is, yeah, the yeah, is in what he sees in his time with trying to negotiate or to parlay at a moment of besiegement. Mm -hmm. And what we get from Montaigne is that there are various examples where this treaty accommodations and parlaying can go so many ways mm -hmm. that if we just took the sense that, okay, when you are negotiating in a treaty that both sides are going to agree and that we were both will bestow honor upon the other and that we will look at it and even kill, it's not like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's, let's, let's explore some of the examples that Montaigne gives. He gives... I almost call a quote unquote bad example where I can't remember. I, we're not going to do the names here because we had trouble even pronouncing them. But one, a let's say a particular king who is or a particular owner of an estate was under siege and he goes with three men to negotiate with the opposing force. And he realizes that they are unmatched and that the opposing side actually backstabs him and he and his men die in the attack, in the ambush. And then there's a safe sort of side, right, where the parlaying actually works. And, and in this moment, a certain knight of a king goes and negotiates with his with the opposing side and he knows that he is going to be or not or that his he's going to be besieged right mm -hmm. and the other side obviously knows it and right. lets him know that you know you're going to lose right and he says yeah i know so what happens then, and I think in, in very dramatic fashion, he sees his castle get blown up, and but he still survives in some sense. And I'm assuming he's taken prisoner or something like that. So then that leaves us with the third option, which is, I think, a, a, a important crux to what we're talking about. And that is the story of Eumenes and Antigonus. And Antigonus, who I believe is besieging Eumenes, is entreating him to come down and to talk to him. And he's taunting him and everything like that. But then Eumenes responds with what Montaigne calls a noble answer. And he says... I shall never esteem a man greater than myself as long as I have my sword in my hand. And he would not consent to come out until Antigonus acceded to his demand to deliver his own nephew, 
Ptolemaeus as a hostage. So we see in this example, I think this this play of having an advantage, having a disadvantage, right? That we're mm -hmm. not coming at it on an even keel that one person's going to engage with the other. Right, and I think that that's mm -hmm. something that we should consider is leverage. Mm -hmm. And leverage is something that I think that we need to really uh, maybe take a closer look at because if you think about it, there's so many contingencies that Montaigne gives in these examples and mm -hmm. the leverage usually changes you know the, the outcome of a situation pretty easily. So even if there's you know, a guarantee of safe passage that might not happen unless if there's a hostage involved. Right. And and Montaigne ends this essay with his 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 take on this idea of advantages and disadvantages and gives his own opinion on how he would approach such parlaying. And he says, and I'll quote him, I'm easily persuaded to trust another's good faith, but... I should less willingly do so if I give him to understand that I did it in despair and from lack of courage, rather than in freedom and trust to his loyalty. So in a sense, he doesn't want to be, I think, and, and maybe you can let me know if you're reading it the same way, he doesn't want to see himself at a disadvantage that he's approaching this negotiation as a weak part of the parlaying mm -hmm. or that he's coming out of you know please grant me mercy you know please please don't kill me but he's coming he wants to come at it from it almost seems as if he's going against this idea of of trying to have advantages in some way because he says like I want to approach a person with good faith that I trust what they're going to do is right. And it's, it's almost again good faith. It almost seems like he's putting faith in them, and I, I don't know if good faith is on a neutral plane or whether it is an advantage or disadvantage. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because there's that underlying. I mean, he says you know that he's you know maybe a more laid back kind of guy and is willing mm -hmm. to trust people more than you know more than than not. But mm -hmm. there's one quotation that I want to that I kind of like really focused in on and that's mm. sort of the I guess underlying current of instability of mm. like that's you shouldn't trust someone too much um, so mm. I'll just read it when the lion's skin is too short according to Lysander we must eke it out with a bit from that of the fox mm. so that's the thing is that maybe the the brave thing to do is to trust someone in good faith and assume okay I won't get ambushed okay great you know, my castle won't be set ablaze the second I step foot out of it. But there's also that undercurrent of you should have leverage and don't be like naive. Like don't don't exercise that mm. sort of like naivete. And Montaigne has before set himself against what he's writing about, right? Mm -hmm. Even when he's talking about sadness, he, he says, well, I'm not really that sad of a guy. I I don't really get depressed like other people do, and maybe in this example he's saying, well, I I don't necessarily think of advantages and dis disadvantages, but I try to approach people honestly and face to face with good humor. I try maybe to use Lysander's language to be like the lion rather than to have to take a couple hairs from the fox I suppose mm -hmm. yeah I mean I don't know but there's also that that function or question of necessity of how far how far can honor and courage mm. get you and I think that's one of the interesting things about this right about this particular essay is that like the others that we've read so far it's admitting to something about being human that perhaps we don't want to admit, right? In what way? That we aren't always like the lion. That mm -hmm. as much as we can say everyone is going to be courageous and that you're going to face me 
you know, you're going to give me the dignity of facing me with courage and valor, that you're going to respect me as I respect you, Mm -hmm. that sometimes people backstab. Sometimes people obliquely approach you, attack your flank. Mm -hmm. Other times people double cross you. Other times people take more money than you were giving to them. Sometimes they don't pay you back. Yeah, that or sometimes this, yeah. yeah, or sometimes you use deception as as to your own advantage. I mean, like if you think about uh, Quintus Fabius, the yes. Roman dictator during the Second Punic Wars, mm-hmm. he just kept stalling for time and just kept avoiding direct engagement because mm-hmm. he knew that at some point Hannibal's resources were going to dwindle. So there's also that to consider. So while Montaigne might say, well, you know, I really, I prefer just to, you know, meet the enemy head on in an honorable way. Mm -hmm. He also kind of sort of on the same, by the same token with these examples shows that sometimes by necessity, like you have to use tact, you have to use stratagem instead of pure sort of force or sheer will or a, just yeah like i'd say like physical strength by various means we arrive at the same same end end. yeah exactly and i think that's what's so fascinating about montaigne is that he's giving us the spectrum of human condition and that perhaps sometimes where problems occur especially in in this particular example of parlaying Mm -hmm. is that we assume people are going to act one way, right? Mm -hmm. People are going to be honorable and they are going to come at you face to face or an even keel. Mm -hmm. But humans are fickle creatures. Yeah. And like, like Lysander said, They'll sometimes take a couple more hairs from the fox instead. Mm -hmm. And that in some ways we have to admit that and have these countermeasures, right? We have to Mm -hmm. make sure that our defenses are in line. We have to make sure that we fact check or we have to do background checks. We have to make sure that we defend ourselves in some way Mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's kind of just using due diligence to stay one or two steps ahead of the person whom you're contending with and i think that Mm -hmm. i mean it can range from anything from i don't know an ancient battle to a a business meeting to oh yeah to modern day politics today to modern day mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think yeah, I think a lot of it does come down to uh, contingency and leverage, and how you can use that sort of points of leveraging to your benefit in those moments in the most effective yes. way. So it's yeah, so it's almost as if it, once you admit that you have to take these measures, or that they could happen, or that the person could double cross you, you are pushing away the notion that everyone is has the hairs of the lion right Mm -hmm. or that everyone is going to act with honor and with courage and is going to face you like like that's that's huge isn't it i mean just just the fact that we have to take countermeasures admits something to the human Experience, or at least to how we view other humans, mm-hmm. it's almost as if we we don't trust each other, right? That there's this breach in trust. Yeah, and I mean, you kind of can't. I mean, you can't always read yeah. people's oh. minds. And I think that, I mean, Montaigne just makes that point with just sort of all these, you know, nuances. And then you also have to, you know, consider too the, you know, the ends and the means. You know, um, I mean, that to to quote Virgil, craft. Or courage, which who cares to ask him with dealing with a foe? Mm-hmm. And what and what did you get from that? That like does it really matter? Yeah, I mean, you also have to kind of consider too, like what are what are the ends that you're trying to pursue? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and whether those ends are just to, well, but then 
the thing would be then that by various means you can arrive at different ends or you mm -hmm. can arrive at the same end like we said that we can claim virtue to a to a general or a soldier who well let's let's say general we can claim valor to a general who attacks head on but we can also claim it to one who is crafty mm -hmm. like who was it again Oh, um, like uh, Quintus Fabius. Like Quintus Fabius, like yeah, I mean, Erwin Rommel, yeah. like mm -hmm. William Tecumseh Sherman. Mm -hmm. that, that those people are just as honorable or are in a, an echelon of military greatness as these soldiers who give, give it all and, you know, attack with, you know, straight on with courage and valor. So... Yeah, there's some weird sort of dichotomy there. Yeah, and I mean, even uh, what came to mind too was uh, the uh, the main character from the Patriot, right? The Swamp Fox of mm -hmm. how he adapted his tactics, which were much more sort of like guerrilla tactics and ambush mm -hmm. tactics, and they were really effective, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I mean, and just to ask you, and maybe maybe we've we've talked about it already, but. In a 21st century world, what what do you gather from Montaigne speaking of of how or whether the governor of a place besieged should go out to parley, right? What what does it tell you about how to live? Whew, um, <laughs> it's kind of a, a loaded question, seeing that I am uh, not necessarily a governor or in a position of leading a sure. state. Which is but, the interesting part, because... But yeah, I would say that, something um, that there's something to be said about uh, the... And I think it's something that we're a little bit more removed from because of sort of modern diplomacy and a lot of, you know... Um, the heads of state aren't necessarily always directly involved in, uh, you know, like military operations. But I think that there have to be, uh, with like certain risks, there also have to be certain guarantees. Mm -hmm. um, so I also think that uh, in, I guess, sort of like diplomatic dealings, there always has to be some sort of level of of, of guile le of, of leverage, <laughs> leverage and, and yeah. yeah, and not completely trusting someone. And I think, I think that's spot on. And and just that, just that fact, that we can't trust everyone, or that we imply that thought through having countermeasures, through militarization in peacetime, you know, through doing fact checks and background checks well it's always it's, having that, yeah. that that level of reassurance i think was it um i think it was roosevelt right who said uh you know speak softly but carry a big stick mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. no matter what situation you're in you're always going to want to have to feel like you have an upper hand or something in your back pocket like you have sort of like you know sort of like an ace up your sleeve yeah and through and and, and mounting through giving these examples and weaving them together in a way we we see how the human condition works in some way you know, through history we can observe how how we act how we mm -hmm. perceive others Mm -hmm. And in this and in this case it, it just seems like you said that we proceed with caution and trepidation in in some respect that we don't assume that everyone is going to be like us mm -hmm. in some respect maybe like they did in the Roman times where they said well everyone should you know face face the enemy with courage and we should have yeah uh, there like, i mean battles. there are definitely times though where they just got like 
wiped out by, because of by ambushes. Yeah, because they kind of just had like targets painted on their backs. I mean, like a lot of a lot of fighting they did in the north against a lot of different tribes. I mean, they didn't fight in that sort of formation. And so they, a lot of times, um, well, especially like the Marian reforms, they a lot of times had to reconfigure their own training tactics and their own stratagem on the battlefield in order mm-hmm. to accommodate people that didn't mm. fight the same way they did of squaring everyone up and so then in that reconfiguration we so you kind of have to do that mentally too right you yeah. have to kind of like have that plasticity and level of responsiveness in order to engage with the enemy even in terms of mm. negotiations um yeah no i yeah. think that's a great point because Montaigne seems to be implying a certain plasticity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I think that it speaks to like what the books, uh, what we've covered so far, and we really have to think about it in the context of him saying, I, I think that it's kind of, how far can honor get you? At some point, you're going to have to yield, but if you're going to have to yield, just try to be diligent about it. Right. But the fact is that you have to yield, that you have to pluck from the fox lest you face the consequences of of trying to be a lion in some mm-hmm. respect because even lions get hunted down right and and that's that's such a harsh reality but maybe in some sense it's freeing to know that we are these fickle and plastic creatures in some respect and that if we go through life with that sort of empathy, as I think Montaigne is showing in this essay, then perhaps we can better understand how how we negotiate or how we go through things and maybe not be surprised or caught off guard if somebody is tentative to something that we do or, or an offer that we give. Mm-hmm. Or if people try to buckle down and be closed off. Or whether even, you know, we look at history or even today and notice political, not unrest, but this, I don't know how to describe it, but just potential energy just bubbling yeah right? it's, and that- it's there could be you know <laughs> i think given the current state of affairs in the u.s like in the u.s there is a uh amount a great amount of tension uh, underlying tension right that's sort, of, sort of boiling under the surface right, and that we can maybe understand through montaigne that perhaps that's because we are not so willing to trust other people right yeah i mean i think that he kind of presents a sort of a perplexing case of um yeah. kind of the i think if we could try to make this sort of more succinct and try to boil down a couple of the main questions to me it's the mm-hmm. question of how far can can bravery get you mm-hmm. and then how far can trust get you yeah i think that's that's a good place to Mm -hmm. yeah so i mean yeah i think before we sign off are there any sort of other sort of main points that we'd like to just like restate for our lovely listeners um i i think it's just what you said that there's this this sense of human plasticity and that thinking that everyone is going to act one way in the sense of showing honor and valor in Playing a, on an even field or an even level. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's like so that's basically trouble. the question of a fair contest. So that's one right. of them. And then what else? And that knowing that people can't that don't do that sometimes we have to get ourselves on different levels or do defensive quote unquote defensive measures. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's basically a balancing act of leveling the playing field. Yeah. So that's one of them. And then I would say for me, it's a question of sort of uh, the means to achieve a certain end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, it's, 
It's such a... And then a function of trust, yeah, right? It's such a... And then courage. Crazy. So those are the main, those are sort of the main points in my mind. Sure. No, it's just a crazy conclusion. I don't know what to, what to think of it, but in some sense it maybe gives me more empathy to the human condition and, and how we go about things. Yeah, and I mean, I think that as much flack as we'd like to give our leaders, these are sort of the questions that, uh, you know, in times of hot, like times of hostility and peace, these are the things that, you know, the people that we trust in positions of power to, to sort of mediate. So there aren't really any easy ones. And I think it's just, yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a lot to think about. It's messy. And complex. And I think as Montaigne uh, iterates throughout this, there aren't any easy answers. No. Human, 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 the human condition is messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I think is that. I think that's it. That's right. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate you following us on this river of a Montaigne essay. And if you want to go down a couple more rivers with us, we encourage you to download the Noetic app, which you can get on Google Play or the App Store. We are also available via YouTube and SoundCloud. So if you would like, please join us again for the next time, another time, or if you want to embark on another river of a different sort from a different land, then please go ahead. But we thank you for meandering with us and we will see you again. And hopefully we can all be a little more empathetic as Montaigne has conveyed to us in this essay. So Yeah, and thanks. thanks for listening and see you next week. <laughs>